Who are the Seventh-day Adventists? Who took the Adventist message to India? Or who took it to other countries? What is the history of Adventist universities, hospitals, and other institutions around the world? My great-grandparents were missionaries to Lake Titicaca. Where can I find information about them? What if we could have reliable answers to these and other questions at our fingertips? This is now possible using the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists online. The Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists, or the ESTA online, is a global church project that includes an estimated 8,500 entries accompanied by photographs, media, and original documents in an online portal accessible to anyone. The ESTA online is a great tool for those seeking to do research and learn more about the Seventh-day Adventist church around the world, and also for those looking to witness to others. The ESTA online is the Adventist church's first online reference work available to the public since June 2020. This free website will be periodically updated. The ESTA is a brand new reference work. It includes historical data from world regions that previously were left out of the encyclopedia. Also, even though the authors of the earlier editions really did try to present an international worldwide perspective, there are some that feel that it was written mostly from a North American perspective. The ESTA draws on the expertise of hundreds of scholars, teachers, and authors worldwide. About 30 assistant editors and research assistants and 25 consultant editors from all 13 divisions, the Middle East and North Africa field, and the General Conference work on the encyclopedia. The advantage of worldwide involvement is that the editors and authors can collect materials from their local churches such as letters and diaries that members keep and never think of sharing unless asked. They can also collect information based on old tradition by conducting interviews with surviving relatives or people who know about specific historical events. Sadly, such information can vanish if not put in writing. Other goals are to supply reliable information on Adventist history, crucial events and themes, organizations, entities, institutions, and people, strengthen Adventist identity in a fast-growing worldwide movement, heightening awareness of distinctive doctrinal and prophetic beliefs, and provide a reference work for those new to the Adventist faith, mature in the faith, and not of the Adventist faith, to learn about all aspects of Adventism. All ESTA articles are signed and include notes and sources. The goal of each ESTA article is to be primary source-based, honest, open, comprehensive, and rigorous, representative of the diversity and richness of Adventism, and fully understandable to both church members and the public. Please check the Get Involved page for the author guidelines and write to encyclopedia at gc.adventist.org or leave a message to the ESDA website. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. It's a familiar statement by Ellen G. White, one of the Adventist church pioneers and co-founders, but with lasting significance. And for us to know God's teachings and leadings, we need to know the facts of our history. Help us fulfill that inspired admonition to remember, record, and rehearse the history of God's church so that together we may go forward fearlessly into the future. I'm excited about the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists online. It will make research about the Adventist church so much easier and more engaging. I will use it and share it with my friends and other people who want to learn more about my faith and my church. Encyclopedia.adventist.org, representing the diversity and richness of Adventist heritage. It is indeed a Sabbath blessing to all those who are watching, uh, whether you're a first-time viewer or you have been uh, viewing our divine service and our worship services right here on YouTube and Facebook. We welcome you today and we want you to just feel at home uh, and be part of this worship experience. You know, there's something about the Sabbath day that after God had created, he says for every other day, it was good. 
but for the Sabbath day, even when he created man, he says it was very good. So you are important to God and the Sabbath is important to God. A couple of announcements uh, for you today. Uh, I just want to share with you a membership transfer of uh, Sue Ann and also Sylvia Clark, our own uh, Windsor Adventist Elementary School teacher, who are going to be joining our membership. And this is the second reading. So if you are close to them, please give them a social distance hug uh, virtually uh, because of the regulations that are before us. And I also just want to give also another, announcements, uh, another announcement for the Black Lives Matter session. It continues today at 6 p.m. So do come and join in, uh, listen, come and learn, and even come and just uh, voice out your opinion as we all pray and look for the action steps to take during this time. So look up for the details somewhere on here. Uh, there'll be Zoom details that are going to be provided. Uh, there will be a midweek uh, prayer session that continues as we have been meeting on Zoom. This is going to be a hybrid, as Pastor likes to call it, a hybrid uh, Zoom session. So some are going to meet as smaller groups in the sanctuary as some continue to meet even on Zoom. Uh, on July 18th, on July 18th, there will be a special Sabbath that focuses on health. And we are going to have uh, Vicky Griffith as our special guest so please do join in pray for the health department as they prepare this power-packed program that will change our health lifestyle and indeed change the way we view life and change the way we communicate with god uh, there will be no board meeting in july so this might be good news or bad news for our board members so on july this month that we're in there'll be no board meeting the next board meeting will be in august I also just want to pause right now and say happy Canada Day to all of you as we are going to be watching uh, our live stream today. We just want to commemorate Canada Day that took place this past Wednesday, July 1st. Uh, I don't know what you did for celebration, uh, but I know that uh, the Spirit was celebrating this beautiful day with us. Uh, I also just want to highlight today our special guests. Whether you are joining us today as a first time viewer or you are just joining us as a regular viewer, I want to say there are special guests that you're going to see on our program today. Uh, the number one being our own psalmist from the motherland, Krina Nshapo. Yes, I did click right there. Uh, it's Krina Krinumuzi Nshapo, who is a musician uh, from South Africa, a Seventh day Adventist uh, musician who believes in proclaiming the everlasting gospel through music. So if you have never been to the motherland, this is your opportunity to experience the worship that takes place in the motherland. And on that note, I want to say, if you want us to experience your worship, wherever you are from, whether you have heritage in the Philippines or you have heritage in the Hispanic uh, countries, please do feel free to nudge me and pastor and say there are some people that I think we should include in this virtual service. Anything is possible right now because of the virtual access that we have. I just want to pause right now and also introduce the person who's very dear to me. Uh, and this is my father. You know, when I was growing up and as I was preparing to introduce him today, uh, I was never taught to call adults by their first name. Uh, but today I'm going to be uh, a little mischievous in the name of Jesus and uh, introduce to you uh, Dr. Pastor Herbert Njovo. Uh, he right now is uh, serving as uh, the Vice President of Student Affairs at Solusi University uh, and is the Director of Student Affairs right there in our mother institution in Solusi, which has a great history of Adventism. Uh, and he's an ordained minister in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, clocking right now over 25 years of ministry. So the next voice that you're going to be hearing after the praise and music, the next voice that you're going to be hearing after the scripture reading, the next voice that you're going to be hearing after the intercessory prayer, the next voice that you're going to be hearing after all is said and done today will be that of none other than Dr. Pastor Herbert Njovo. So our call to worship today is John chapter 4 verses 33. It says, yet a time, yet a time is coming. And now, my dear friends, is the time. Now the time has come that the true worshippers worship God the Father in truth and in spirit, for they are kind of worshippers that the Father seeks. So as we go into this worship service, open up your heart and say, Jesus, come into my heart. Transform me today and make me renewed as I go into a new week. May I receive bread, a daily bread that I cannot get anywhere else except from you alone.
So blessings to you as you worship and may God continue to be with you in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you that we are going to have a wonderful time in your presence. We pray that as we worship with the saints at Windsor SDA Church, you be with us. Let glory and honor go to you at the end of this session. In your name we pray, amen. It's good to worship with you, saints. I know that our God answers prayers, okay? Let's keep going. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength in thee.
Father, till we meet again, possibly next year in May, when we do our tour, Heavenly Father. Keep us safe, help us to remember to tell people to sanitize, to wash hands, to keep a safe distance, Heavenly Father. We know that COVID is real, but you are the real deal. Thank you that you'll be with us till we meet again. If we don't meet down here, we'll meet in the clouds of glory. In Christ Jesus we pray, amen. God bless you, Windsor SDA Church, till we meet again. Bye-bye. Happy Sabbath, church family. Now is the time for us to come together and pray wherever we are. Even though it may be virtual, let us pray together for the future of our church that God may bless us. So I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes wherever you may be. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for allowing us as a congregation to still be together, even while apart. Lord. I pray that you would bless each and every one of us. Continue to be with us, comfort us, give us peace and a direction of what we must do in these times. I pray, Lord, that you would bless the renovations that are going on at church. As some of this congregation are able to commit time to help and to update and restore certain aspects of our building, continue to bless them with strength and energy, continue to guide the work that our church May be ready for when we return to be together. I pray, Lord, that you'd bless the team that is working hard to find solutions for when we come out of this quarantine phase, when we come out of this restrictions. I pray, Lord, that you would help our church to be ready, that when we are allowed to come together, everything would be just right, that no one would catch any infections or disease or virus, but Lord, that we would be prepared. I pray, Lord, that you'd bless the speaker we have today, that the message would be relevant for us to hear, that it would personally touch our hearts and minds and inspire us for what you are asking us to do in this world. I pray, Lord, continue to be with us in whatever we may be doing. Some of us may still be working on the front lines. Some of us may, be still, be, may still be working at home. Lord, continue to be with us. Direct us, and Lord, illumine our lives that we may have a better understanding of the future, that we may not be afraid of things to come, but that we may trust you, knowing that you are with us every step of the way. Lord, there are many things that we must pray for. There are many requests on each individual's heart. And Lord, I just want to raise them up to you now for a few seconds. God, I pray that you'd comfort those who are hurting, that you'd heal those who are sick, that you'd be with those who are struggling, and that no matter what the circumstances may be, may we always know that our God is bigger than our problems, and he will see us through. Be with us now and always. I pray this in your most holy and precious name. Amen. Jesus tells us, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew 6, 21. We have heard this text many times. Mrs. White in her book, Beyond Blessings, page 23, writes, Every opportunity to help a brother, 
in need or to aid in the cause of God in the spread of the truth is a pearl that you can send beforehand and deposit in the bank of heaven for safekeeping. She also writes, What shall we do with our time, our understanding, our possessions, which are not ours, but are entrusted to us to test our honesty? Let us bring them to Jesus. Let us use our treasures for the advancement of his cause. Thus we shall obey the injunction, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. We are part of God's heavenly kingdom. Let us return our tithes and offerings as joyful members of God's kingdom. The offering today is for the ministries and needs of our local church budget. Let's bow ahead for prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you for being our creator, our sustainer, and our life. We come to you as we bring our tithes and offerings. May you bless it for building up your church here in Windsor. We thank you for providing for our daily needs, and we ask that you be with those who are in need financially as well. For this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Change your mindset and change your life. What is mindset anyway? Your mindset is your basic outlook in life. A person's mindset influences his or her thoughts, words, actions, and health, both physical and mental. If you suspect that your attitude needs adjusting, the good news is your brain constantly reshapes itself according to what it learns, thinks, feels and expects. According to author and psychiatrist John Rady, experiences, thoughts, actions, and emotions actually change the structure of our brains. Good news! Habits of thinking are changeable, tunable, and improvable. One necessary precursor to change, though, is often a change of attitude. Our basic attitude affects how we think, feel, and act in spite of circumstances or regardless of circumstances, it's a mindset. Social scientist Carol Dweck is the author of the book, Mindset. She asks an essential question. Do you have a fixed or growth approach to life? Fixed mindsets believe that ability and personality are basically inborn, unchangeable, and set in stone. Fixed mindsets believe that if they actually have to work at improving, it means they must be lacking in basic intelligence or ability. The fixed mindset thinks, if it's meant to be, it should be easy. A fixed mindset is more focused on how will I look rather than how can I learn. They have no recipe for healing, moving forward, and solving problems. Growth mindsets believe that although people differ in basic aptitudes and temperament, everyone can change, grow, and improve. They have a passion for stretching and growing, even when they're making mistakes and facing challenges. Which mindset sounds more hopeful to you? The growth mindset person may not feel smart, but they want to get smart, and they're willing to work at it. Dr. John Rady claims, we are not prisoners of our genes or our environment. We always have the ability to remodel our brains. God designed human beings with a marvelous capacity to learn, grow, and improve in every area of life, including our mental habits and thinking. We can all learn and grow. Here's how we begin. First, determine to identify and replace faulty internal monologues. Be aware and beware of your thoughts. We can literally think ourselves into a frenzy or into a calm. Focus on truth and solutions, not untrustworthy feelings and fear. How? Learn God's truth. Truth is found in God's Word. Spend time each day reading the Bible 
talk to God in prayer. Think and meditate on what God says. What we magnify will get bigger. We can choose to focus on the bigness of our problems or the greatness of God, the great problem solver. This is not easy, but just because it isn't easy doesn't mean you can't do it. Second, train your mouth to speak God's word instead of untrustworthy feelings. Words have power, nuclear power. Our words have a powerful effect on our thoughts, mood, emotions, and behavior. For instance, I can wake up in the morning and say, I dread this day. I can't see anything good that will come of it. That's fear and negativity speaking. Or I can say, God, thank you for this day of life. Thank you that you will give me the strength and wisdom to meet the challenges that I'm going to face today. That's truth and that's faith. Words are powerful. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat its fruit. Have you ever heard someone say, you're going to eat your words? Well, it's true. We do. What we say and how we say it affects others, but it also reacts upon ourselves. That doesn't mean we don't have problems to deal with, think about, and discuss. We need to talk about life and interact with others during good times and bad. But the way we talk about our problems can help or hurt us and others. When we understand the power of words to hurt or heal, our lives can be transformed. Third, hold yourself accountable. Monitor your thoughts and words. Sometimes we characterize our problems as personal, pervasive, and permanent. We can wear ourselves out, mountain climbing over molehills, leaving us faithless, hopeless, and nerveless when we have to confront a real challenge. Time with God will help you put your problems in perspective and incline your thoughts towards hope, peace, and solutions. Remember, choosing a new way of thinking is like learning any other skill. It takes practice, it takes patience, it takes prayer, and it takes the power of God. I saw a sign on an executive's desk that said, you're smiling because you don't understand the situation. Well, that may be true, but remember this, you can smile because God does understand the situation and he's preparing your deliverance even when you can't see a way out. Christ will renew you and help you to grow and change. New you, think about it. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may learn by experience what God's will is. Jesus died to set you free and give you a new mindset of hope, obedience, perseverance, and victory. The power is His, the choice is yours, the time is now. Good morning, church. Today's scripture reading is found in Titus chapter 2, verse 11. And it says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. May God bless the reading of this word. Sweet. 
happy Sabbath saints of the living God. We are very happy once again for yet another blessed Sabbath where we can sit at the feet of Christ and listen to him speak to us. I want to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Pulovenko, Windsor Church Leadership, Windsor Church members for inviting me to minister to God's people. It's a great honor for me and my family to be part of Windsor Church this blessed supper. Our message for this supper is entitled the impartiality of God's grace. The impartiality of God's grace. We begin with the word of prayer. Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we invoke the presence of the Holy Spirit, asking you to be in our midst as we worship you on this blessed Sabbath. May you be with us and talk to us, minister to our various situations, our predicaments. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing us together in our places of abode. Speak to us through your spoken word. This is my prayer in Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Our message, the impartiality of God's grace in a world filled with the sorrow, filled with a lot of challenges around us. Let us talk about the grace of God. Our key text for our message is taken from the New Testament, coming from the book of Titus, written by Paul, Titus 2, verse 11. Here it reads from the New King James Version. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. May God bless a special blessing on Titus 2, verse 11. As we look at Titus 2, verse 11, we see that the grace of God that brings salvation to all human beings, it brings salvation. It is interesting to note that this grace of God is not exclusive, but it is inclusive, accommodating everyone, hence appearing to every human being under the sun. What a God who understands and knows where we are because he is interested to our salvation it is his desire that both male and female in whatever situation in whatever circumstances his grace must 
be accessed by everyone, an inclusive grace for our salvation, for our redemption. Our focus will be on the impartiality of this grace of God, which is inclusive, available to everyone. Let me begin by defining what grace is. The word grace from our Greek language, which the New Testament was written, means kindness, favor. In the context of our message, may I define grace as a favor to one who is undeserving, one who is lost, and the one who is a sinner. We understand that all of us, when we fell into sin in the Garden of Eden, through Adam and Eve, we then became sinners. Since we are all sinners, God, through his grace, has favors has favored us with this grace, bringing us closer to him, bringing us back to his fold, bringing us back so that we may enjoy eternity with him when he comes again to take us home. Grace, it is interesting again to note that by gender, it is feminine. And we know very well that anything that is feminine in gender has a potential of being very productive. The grace of God is feminine, it is productive. How productive it is. It is this very grace that has produced sense out of us. While we were sinners, God favored us and gave us his grace. So today, let us deal with the amazing truth that a part of God's grace in the context of it being in an impartial grace. We begin with the first truth on God's amazing grace. The first truth about the impartiality of God's amazing grace reads as follows. Grace does not discriminate. Our key text says, for the grace of God has appeared to everyone. Since it has appeared to everyone, it is true and it's a fact that it does not discriminate. It is a free gift given to all who are willing to accept it. Titus 2 verse 11. According to Ellen White, she writes, Christ gave his life to make it possible for man to be restored to the image of God. It is the power of his grace that draws men together in obedience to his truth. Since God has given us grace, Ellen White says, God uses this grace to restore us back to the original image that he gave us before we fell into sin. Very interesting to realize that the grace of God does not discriminate anyone under the sun. It is given as a gift, given as a gift to you, given as a gift to me, given as a gift to anyone who are willing to accept it. And hence, when we accept it, 
It gives us power to be obedient to all God's truth. Truth number two. Christ's grace is also demonstrated in Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. We have Jesus, according to John 4. Jesus had a length conversation with a Samaritan woman by the well of Jacob. When you look at it, the scenario there, Jesus, by birth, he was a Jew. And the Jews and the Samaritans could not see each other eye to eye. They were enemies. There was a wall of partition that divided Jews and the Samaritans. But when Jesus came by the well of Jacob, he found a Samaritan woman. And the record says he had a length conversation. And his conversation with the Samaritan woman is a clear demonstration that God's grace is not partial, but is an impartial because it accommodates even those that are not accommodated by society. The Samaritan woman, even his own people, had a relegated head. They had looked at her as an outcast. But Jesus, by the well of Jacob, spent time with her, speaking to her. He created a platform for her to access all this grace. And as a result of the conversation that Jesus had with the Samaritan woman, the Samaritan woman was now open to talk to Jesus because of the platform that had been created by God. And hence, the Samaritan woman saw in Jesus a different man for the first time. She had interacted and mingled with the several men within the city of Samaria. But in Jesus, he saw a different man from these other men that she had interacted with before. In Jesus, the Samaritan woman saw in what we call in his room, in daughter, and a funny the man daughter. Meaning a man unique, peculiar. And in Jesus, because of how Jesus spoke to her and how Jesus interacted with her and how Jesus gave her a platform to open up this lady saw a different man from this other man who were only there to use him. But Jesus had interest in her eternity. He saw a different man in Jesus. The Samaritan woman, for the first time in Jesus, he saw the hope of all nations, the desire of all nations. In Jesus, he saw a well springing up with everlasting life. And as a result, we hear her saying, Savior, give me that water that will spring up in my heart so that I will not come again to draw water from this well. This is Jesus. And as a result of that, the Samaritan woman's hope was revived. The Samaritan uh, 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 lady's future was now clear and now a future with the certainty. And uh, hence, she was so much blessed by this conversation with Jesus. And in Jesus, she found divine impartial grace. And as a result, she quickly left her water jar and ran into the city and invited uh, the residents of the city and they say, come and they see a man, a different man who has given me hope. 
And I know this very man can also give you hope. My dear brothers and my dear sisters, we live in a world where people have become hopeless. The situations that are around us make us hopeless. We don't even know what the future holds, but the grace of God gives us hope. The grace of God enables us to move forward. The grace of God has that power to lift us up, put us into another platform, and we move forward, and the future becomes brighter and brighter. And then why it says, Jesus broke down the partition which was between the Jews and the Samaritans. And Jesus had now an opportunity now after talking to the Samaritan woman to speak to the entire city. As a member of Windsor Church, you can do like Jesus. You can create a platform for people to connect with Jesus. You can create an, an opportunity for people to access the grace of God. I want to submit to you this very morning that do like Jesus. Look for those who are marginalized. Look for those whose society has a, 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 a put them aside. Create a platform for them. Create a, an opportunity for them to connect with their creator. And Jesus created that platform with the Samaritan woman and the entire city of Samaria was brought closer to God. And they were brought closer to the knowledge of God. And as a result of that conversation, we hear from scripture, the entire city was spoken to. And they accepted Jesus as their Savior. The record says, Jesus had to stay with the Samaritans for the next four days. But it all uh, was a result of that conversation with the Samaritan woman. Truth number three, the grace of Jesus came and uh, will transform hard, crooked characters. Our society, our communities are filled with people whose characters are crooked, whose characters are evil, very wicked. But the grace of God can transform such wicked characters. Hence, never give up on people. Never write people off. The grace of God has that potential to help them to bounce back. Your very son at home can be mischievous. Don't write him off. Your daughter may be mischievous. Don't write her off. Your neighbor may appear. She is not interested to spiritual things. Don't write her off. Your friend at work may not have any interest on spiritual things. Don't give up on him or on her. The grace of God can has that potential to transform them. Remember that you cannot read the hearts of people. You do not know the motives which prompted them to do what looks wrong. There are many around us as Windsor church members, many around us who are with us at work, who are with us at home, who are around us as neighbors, 
who have not come to the knowledge of God's grace. And the, what they are doing, obvious, is contrary to the will of God. And the, all is a result of their lack of knowledge or lack of information about God's grace. But when the grace of God that has appeared to all men through you after creating an opportunity or a platform for them to hear more about God's grace, this very grace of God can transform them. Hence, never cast them aside. Never drive them to discouragement. Ellen White, in Ministry of Healing, she says, you must not say to them, you have disappointed me. I will not try again to help you. You have disappointed me. This is Ellen White. She says, never say those words. That you have disappointed me, my friend. You have disappointed me, my son. You have disappointed me, my neighbor. You have disappointed me, my classmate. You have disappointed me, my, 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 my friend. I will not help you again. Ellen White says, we must not utter such statements. Let us not drive them away. Let us not write them off. The grace of God has power to bring them back. I know as human beings, we are quick to give up on people. We are quick to give up on our neighbors. We are quick to give up on our friends. We are quick to give up on uh, our relatives. But just remember this morning, the grace of God has power to transform them. The grace of God has power to bring them back to the image of God. The grace of God has power to change and transform their characters. Let us not give up on them. Truth number four, Jesus' patience with Judas. Jesus' patience with Judas demonstrates the impartiality of God's grace. That is truth number four. Jesus was very patient and tolerant with Judas to a point that Jesus had to give him a place within the ministry. He called 12 disciples. And after calling 12 disciples, one of the 12 disciples was Judas Iscariot, who was a thief, very dishonest, and a crook among the disciples of Jesus, a very dishonest church member, a very crooked church member, a thief within the church. But Jesus accommodated him, knowing his conduct, knowing his character, knowing his evil thought, he still accommodated him. He was patient patience with him and they gave him a place among the disciples. Did you know that as members of Windsor Church you do have the Judas. You have the Judas among yourself. They are those that are so difficult to forgive, accommodate them. There are those within Windsor Church that are so difficult to love, love them anyhow. There are those within Windsor Church who are so rough, accommodate them, give them a place in the church, and they place them in a particular position where the grace of God will still operate within their hearts. 
and they bring them back and they transform them as Jesus gave to us an opportunity. This is what Ellen White says in the case of Judas. Ellen White says, the Savior did not repulse Judas. He gave him a place among the twelve. He trusted him to do the work of an evangelist. And they trusted him to do the work of an elder. He trusted him with the work of a preacher. He was a preacher. And they even gave him power to heal the sick and to drive the demons. In spite of his dishonesty, Jesus accommodated him. And what it says, but it taught us did not come to the point of surrendering himself fully to Jesus. He did not give up his worldly ambition of man. Judas was blinded to his own weakness of character and the Christ placed him where he would have an opportunity to see and correct this. What are we supposed to do as Windsor church leadership? What are we supposed to do as Windsor church members? Let us not push them outside the church. The Judas who are in our midst, let us place them in a position where the grace of God will still work with them. Let us leave them to God. His grace has an, a potential to transform them. The very grace of God has produced a church elder out of you. You were never born a church elder. You were never born a deacon. You were never born a pastor. You were never born a preacher. You were never born a member. You were never born an Adventist. But the grace of God has produced a powerful pastor out of you, a powerful preacher out of you, a powerful elder out of you, a powerful husband out of you, a powerful wife out of you, a powerful medical doctor out of you, a powerful lawyer out of you, a powerful officer out of you, a powerful child of God out of you. Imagine if we had given up on you, where would you be? Where would I be? The grace of God has produced a preacher out of me. The last truth, Christ's grace is no respecter of nationality, race, language, tribe, and the creed. Christ's grace is no respect of nationality, race, language, tribe, and the creed. What do I mean? I mean according to John 3, verse 16, whosoever believe in Jesus has everlasting life. The grace of God has no respect of nationality, no respect of race or language. As long as you are, as long as you are created in God's image, the grace of God is searching after you, is looking after you, so that you may be brought to the fault of God. Hence, Take note of this, no distinction on account of nationality, no distinction on account of race, no distinction on account of tribe, no distinction on account of status. There are those that are married and there are those that are not married. There are those that are divorced and there are those that are 
that, that are not divorces. On account of God's grace, there is no distinction. God does not recognize either of our status. Uh, his grace is sufficient to all of us and it reaches to all of us wherever we are in life, available regardless of our status in life. He's the maker of all human beings and he's interested to our salvation. He's interested to our redemption. May I say, as we look at the impartiality of God's grace, which he has no respecter of nationality, no respecter of race, no respecter of language differences, no respecter of denomination, denominational affiliation, the grace of God is there for everyone, whosoever, in that whosoever, we are included. Our neighbors are included. Our friends at work are included. Our members of our family are included. Even those who have not come to the knowledge of God, whosoever may be sent as long as you believe in Jesus. As I look at it, this grace of God, I see God operating on what is known as one anotherness. By one anotherness, I mean, don't see nationality, don't see tribe, don't see, uh, don't see uh, language, but see people. One anotherness says, don't see race, don't see nationality, don't see color, but to see people. Jesus sees people in all of us and he's interested to our salvation. As members of Windsor, we come from different people group. There are those who are coming from Jamaica. There are those who are coming from Korea. There are those who are coming from Africa. There are those who are coming from Asia. There are those who are coming from uh, America. We are all what is people. We belong to one big family, the family of God. Hence, let us not see color. Let us not see child. Let us not see language. Let us not see race. Let us see people. People, people matter. Jesus died for people. He's coming for people. And he's coming to take us home as people. Grace of God has no respect of nationality. Because the grace of God is not a specter of nationality. Did you know, members of Windsor, all men, all men under the sun, all human beings under the sun, are of one family by creation. All human beings under the sun by creation. They are of one family. I want you to take note of that one. All humanity under the sun are of one big family, the family of God. As it wins the church, you are part of that one big family of God. Another church in Asia, Japan, Korea, China, other churches in Africa, they also, when they come together, we are also part of this one big family, the family of God. How do we become one big family of God? We all become one big family of God through creation. Genesis 1, verse 27, he created them, male and the female, and out of those two, Adam and Eve, we all are one because we come from Adam and Eve and through creation we become one big family and also through redemption by Jesus on Calvary we also become one big family in Galatians 3 verse 28 and the Paul then affirms this truth he says there is no truth 
no Gentile, no bond or slave, no male or female. We are all equal in the eyes of God. We are all equal in the eyes of God. We make one big family. Our sisters at the Windsor Church deserve the grace of God. Our children at the Windsor Church deserve the grace of God. Let us not deny them the grace of God. Let us not starve them of the grace of God. Let us allow them to freely operate within the family of God. Grace of God is available to everyone. We are one big family, the family of God. Jesus, through his blood on Calvary, has brought us closer to himself. And his interest is to make one big family. May God help you, help me, help us. Help Windsor church leadership. Help Windsor church members. Help us to understand that the grace of God does not discriminate. The grace of God motivates us to even accommodate those that are so hard to live with, to accommodate those that are so difficult to love, let us love them and allow them also to be part of God's family. The grace of God will work with their characters and transform them. And out of them, the grace of God has a potential to produce a saint, a leader. May God give us that grace. May God fill our hearts, fill our homes with this grace. Fill our workplace with this grace. Fill our offices with this grace. Fill his church with this grace. Fill our marriages with this grace. That as we live together, may we live at peace. Because the grace of God has been manifested in our homes, manifested in our marriages, manifested in our, in, our, in our churches. Let our churches be filled with God's grace. May this be our experience as the new week will begin that is before us. Even the corona, COVID-19, that is giving us a headache, that is giving us a challenge. Did you know, fellow brothers, and the sisters, that you and me, to wake up is, is, is an act of God's grace. To have a family is an act of God's grace. To have a business is an act of God's grace. To have a job is an act of God's grace. To go to school is an act of God's grace. We are a result of God's grace. The grace of God is there 24 7. Hence, if it is available, may we create a platform for other people to have access to it. May we create some opportunities for other people also to, 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 access, to, to, to be accommodated and also to, to experience this wonderful grace, this marvelous grace that has power to transform them. It will be interesting and a great honor for you and your family to be saved when Jesus comes again. You and your neighbor to be saved when Jesus comes again. You and your workmate to be saved when Jesus comes again. You and your classmate to be saved when Jesus comes again. You and your parents to be saved when Jesus comes again. Do your best. God has done his best. Whosoever, please take note of that. Whosoever will believe will have internal life. The grace of God is available. May this grace give us hope and give us strength to move forward with our Christian life. Be blessed.
I want to pray with someone. We are praying. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace that is sufficient. Thank you for your grace that is available. Thank you for your grace that deals even with crooked characters. Thank you for your grace that does not allow us to give up on people, give up on our friends, give up on our relatives, give up on our children, who sometimes are very difficult to raise and to interact with. Your grace does not allow us to give up on them. We thank you, God, for speaking to us in the language that we understand, in a manner that makes us understand you well and appreciate you even much more. As the new week will begin, may your grace be sufficient in our families, sufficient in our workplaces, sufficient in our schools, in our marriages. Whatever we do, may we experience your grace. Thank you so much, Father. May you fill our hearts, our homes, our churches with your grace. Prepare us for your soon return and take us, take care of us. Even as we go through this corona pandemic, may your grace be sufficient. Protect us from the pandemic. Those that are sick, may your grace, that has that potential, heal them for our sake. Those that have lost their loved ones because of the pandemic, comfort them and give them hope as you get the Samaritan hope. Thank you so much, Jesus. Be with us and bless us. This is our prayer. In your name I pray. Amen.